Clinical Biochem. So in this screencast, um, this is my first in a series of screencasts where we're going to be digging into cellular respiration. And this is a process that essentially every organism on Earth does because every organism on Earth needs energy. So um, I'm hoping you already watched this Amoeba Sisters video on cellular respiration. It's a short video that I think gives you a good big picture overview. Um, and so if you haven't watched that yet, pause and go take a look at that. But let's go ahead and start to look at some of the um, kind of big picture context for understanding cellular respiration. So fundamentally, cellular respiration is simply getting usable energy out of food, which is pretty darn important. Right? We are living things that are constantly, constantly using energy. And in this case, the, the molecule that is gold right, for living things is ATP, adenosine triphosphate. And as great as glucose is as sort of a food source or breaking our food down into glucose, in that form, it is not useful to ourselves, right? In order to actually be able to power all of these different cellular processes, we need to stay alive, like cell reproduction, cell repair, transport, making new proteins, copying DNA, like all of this stuff requires ATP as the source of energy that can make those processes energetically favorable. Um, and this means that every living thing has to make ATP through cellular respiration. Okay, so quick reminder about ATP, um, adenosine triphosphate is called triphosphate because it has these three phosphate groups sticking off the end. And this bond between the last two phosphates contains this really useful sort of nugget of energy that can be used to power all sorts of processes. So we think of the ATP as being like a charged battery, right? And then when that battery gets used to power a process, when this bond gets broken to power a process, this turns into ADP, adenosine diphosphate, di because it has two phosphates attached. And this can be converted back to ATP again um, by reattaching a phosphate to the end um, and recharging that molecule. And essentially what cellular respiration is doing is it's trying to convert as many used up ADP molecules into energized ATP molecules that can power cellular processes. So let's take a look at that. There are basically two pathways for respiration, um, depending on whether there is oxygen present. So anaerobic versus aerobic respiration. And aerobic basically just means involving air. In this case, the air we're concerned with is oxygen gas. So an just means not. So anaerobic means not involving air, not involving oxygen, and aerobic means involving oxygen. Anaerobic is actually the more ancient pathway because in early earth there wasn't a lot of oxygen available. So it's it's gotten us to where we are today. But it turns out anaerobic respiration is a pathway that in lieu of because there is no oxygen present. Um, it's actually not very efficient. So if you look at these two anaerobic pathways that animals in yeast can take, if there are no ox if there is no oxygen present, they each can only make two ATP molecules out of an entire glucose, right? Whereas if oxygen is present, and if you have an organism like an animal or a plant that can undergo aerobic respiration, you can see it's a vastly more efficient process where one glucose could yield up to 38 ATP molecules. So it's an incredible amount of usable energy um, out of sugar. So you can see how this became really beneficial um, in our evolutionary history. And you can see why most multicellular organisms like plants and animals that have very high energetic needs rely on aerobic respiration to stay alive, right? They can't function for very long without oxygen um, because they need that in order to get sufficient energy out of their food, out of their sugar. So key takeaway here is you can do respiration without oxygen anaerobically, but it doesn't make nearly as much ATP as if you follow the aerobic pathway. Okay, so we're really going to focus on aerobic respiration um, in this unit because that's really what keeps animals and plants alive, and we rather selfishly kind of want to focus on that. And it's a really remarkable process. So quick reminder, aerobic means in the presence of oxygen. 
Um, this is how plants and animals produce the vast majority of their energy and some other organisms as well. Um, it occurs in both the cytoplasm outside of the mitochondria and also inside the structure called the mitochondria. Um, and it produces far more ATP than anaerobic respiration with no oxygen present. And this is the net reaction for this process, right? And if you take a look at this reaction, take a moment, just pause the video and examine this reaction. And I'm hoping this looks very familiar to you because this basically is just the inputs and outputs of, of photosynthesis swapped, right? So in photosynthesis, the plants were absorbing carbon dioxide and water and light energy and producing glucose and oxygen. And in cellular respiration, the reverse process is happening because the whole point is we're trying to break down glucose to get energy. Another thing I want you to think about as you look at this reaction is think back to those types of reactions that you learned about last year in Biochem 1, right? These five types of reactions. Pause the video and identify which type of reaction does this actually look like. And I'm hoping you noticed this is a combustion reaction, right? As in, we have a hydrocarbon here. Sugar is a type of hydrocarbon. It has hydrogen and carbon. It reacts with oxygen to produce carbon dioxide and water and releases a large amount of energy because it's an exothermic process. So really, like on a most fundamental level, looking at the inputs and outputs, this is combustion of sugar. We're literally, that's why we talk about burning our calories, right, um, to get energy. However, we're not actually literally just burning that sugar. We could, you could go into your kitchen. I don't recommend you do this, but you could go into your kitchen and, you know, light some, dissolve some sugar and like burn it on your stove and it will release a large amount of heat. It might even catch on fire, right? Um, however, that would not be very useful to us in our bodies, which is why we don't just burn the sugar in one single reaction. Right? And there's a couple reasons for that. One is it would take a huge amount of activation energy, like input of heat, say, to get that started, which our bodies can't provide. But more importantly, it doesn't do us any good. It's a waste of sugar because all of that energy would just get lost as heat. Right? And heat is not useful to us. Right? We are not turbines. Right? We need this instead to be used to make ATP cellular energy that can power the processes in our body. And so instead of completely combusting the sugar in one reaction, we instead are going to have this complex process that involves lots of stepwise redox reactions, right? And with each of these redox reactions, we're gonna gradually harvest more and more energized electrons off of this sugar and onto these activated carrier molecules, more about those in a minute, but we're going to harvest energized electrons and then use those electrons to power the production of ATP, right? So the whole point is we're trying to find a controlled way to harvest all of the energy stored in these chemical bonds in glucose and convert that to the energy of ATP as efficiently as we possibly can because you know, in evolutionary history, sometimes food is short. We can't, we can't waste it. So thinking about this in terms of redox, then let's take a look at the overall inputs and outputs of cellular respiration. And again, remember, this is not a single reaction. In fact, it's many, many, many reactions that get us from these starting materials to these ending materials. But it's still really useful to use our redox skills to kind of track where are the electrons coming from and where are they ending up. So pause the video, um, go ahead and assign oxidation states to each of these elements, write a half reaction for what's oxidized and write a half reaction for what's reduced and then hit play when you think you've got that. Okay, so um, hopefully you came up with something like this with our redox rules. So remember free elements have an oxidation state of zero, Hydrogen pretty much always has an oxidation state of plus one and oxygen has an oxidation state of minus two when they're in covalent compounds. And then working backwards, that means that once this carbon that was part of glucose um, is released in carbon dioxide, it has gone from an oxidation number of zero to plus four, which means each carbon is sort of 
giving up access to four electrons, right? So with the six carbons involved in this reaction, that means that we're actually transferring a total of 24 electrons away from these carbons, right? And then the flip side of that is we start out with elemental oxygen, right? And those electrons are actually getting transferred to the oxygen, right? Those 24 electrons are transferred to these 12 oxygens from atmospheric oxygen to produce the oxygens that are in water. And we'll talk more about that uh, shortly, okay? Okay, so the key thing I wanted you to notice here then, if we look back at this, is this is a lot of electrons getting transferred. And the transfer of that electron, right? The transfer of those electrons from carbon eventually to oxygen, right? Is what's actually going to power um, this whole process of making ATP aerobically, right? And this is not done immediately, right? This is not a reaction where the the carbon just dumps its electrons on the oxygen. Instead, we're going to be using electron carriers, right? Just like in photosynthesis, we had carrier molecules in photosynthesis, specifically NADPH. Here, our carrier molecules are NADH and FADH2. But the key thing I want you to notice in this sort of big picture diagram of aerobic cellular respiration is that we are harvesting electrons, right? So we have this cycle that's really all around harvesting electrons from our carbons, right? And then these uh, electrons are going to get dropped off in an electron transport chain at the end of this that is actually going to power the production of ATP. So more about that soon. Let's look a little closer at our electron carriers before we get into this. So the first electron carrier that we're going to encounter is called NADH, right? NAD is um, an abbreviation for a larger, more complex molecule that you don't need to be familiar with the shape of. Um, and then its sort of empty partner is NAD+. So NAD plus is the oxidized form that is capable of accepting electrons. And when it has accepted two electrons and a hydrogen, it becomes NADH, which can act as an electron donor. And when it donates its electrons, when it is oxidized and donates its electrons, it will convert back to NAD+, right? And we'll talk more about this in just a minute, but NAD+, right, is going to be an input into glycolysis in the Krebs cycle, where it's going to pick up electrons from carbons, and then it's going to drop those electrons off at the electron transport chain to power that electron transport chain. And once it has dropped off its electrons and turned back to NAD+, right, that NAD+, can be returned to glycolysis and the Krebs cycle to be reloaded with H+, and energized electrons again. So it can be sort of continuously cycled back and forth. Just a quick reminder, this should sound familiar, and students often get these mixed up. In photosynthesis, our electron carrier was called NADPH. It is structurally similar, but not identical to NADH, which is why it has a different name. And the way I remember this is I think P for photosynthesis. So NADPH is the electron carrier used in photosynthesis. NADH is the electron carrier used in cellular respiration. Okay, let's look at our second electron carrier, which is FADH2. So same idea here. It works the exact same way, right? So the um, uh, oxidized version of FADH2 is FAD. Again, this is an abbreviation for a large, more complex molecule. And FAD um, is going to feed into the Krebs cycle, where it's going to pick up electrons from carbon, right? So it's going to be reduced by electrons from carbon, two electrons and a hydrogen atom, a hydrogen ion, which will convert it into FADH2. And then FADH2 will head to the electron transport chain. It will drop off these electrons and be converted back to FAD, which can then return to the Krebs cycle to get reloaded again, okay? All right. So I'm going to pause there, and in my next video, we're going to actually start getting into the details of this process.